Good evening. Thank you for joining us for this evening's webinar and our DNR Warden Recruitment Information Session. My name is Sarah Hoy, and I'm the Communications Director for the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. Joining us this evening to talk about this rewarding career are Conservation Warden Captain Kara Kamke and Conservation Warden Mary Bish. Following this evening's presentation, we will have time for a few questions. And with that, Kara, over to you. Thanks so much, Sarah. I think at first we're gonna watch this awesome video. Sorry guys, one second, tech issues. And with that, Thanks. Kara, over to you. Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, and thank you all for joining us here today. Um, as the information it was presented, um, we are gonna go over the conservation warden hiring process. And we're gonna finish up with a little bit about what to expect for the first year training. So um, we're hoping that this information is stands kind of the test of time. So what you see on the screen right now is kind of a general overview of our annual hiring process. Um, if we in the future make any updates to this, we'll be either sure to update the webinar or post that information on our warden recruitment website. Um, but first things first, um, here you can kind of see our, the overview of our timeline. We are anticipating launching our process for conservation wardens as the video showed next week um, in 2022. And every year we expect to launch that in the February, March timeline. Generally speaking, that um, timeline or that open recruitment is only open for about three weeks. So it's a fairly short window of time. Um, if you're watching this now, you're aware of it, which means you can start getting your application materials ready. If you're considering applying in future years, um, you can always subscribe to our warden recruitment newsletter and be notified when that comes out just so you don't miss an opportunity for hiring because we do only hire for wardens once a year. And as the slide mentions, that opens in about February and March around that time frame. Our interview process, or our hiring process, I should say, is pretty lengthy. We often get a lot of applications, which is very good news for us, um, but that just means it takes a little bit more time to screen those applicants. Plus, with this being a law enforcement position, we have to do a very thorough job, making sure we're asking all the right questions, doing a thorough reference check, um, and really checking all the boxes that's required for a law enforcement position through the state of Wisconsin. So the first thing that happens after the initial application closes is an interview screen, which we'll talk a little bit more about those. Then the second part is a panel interview with fitness assessments. After that step in the process, we move on to the background investigations. There's a post investigation interview and then conditional job offers are made in early September with the anticipated onboarding date or start date in that late October. So um, you do have to keep in mind, it is a lengthy process, but what we're gonna do today is gonna break down each of those steps, hopefully provide you with some information about what you can expect during each of those steps in the process, really how to prepare yourself and what we're really looking for in conservation wardens. So with that, I'll start discussing the um, initial application which can be found on the next slide. Thank you. So our initial application is um, going to be, as mentioned in 2022, um, posted to WIS Jobs starting on Monday, February 14th. Um, you can always go to WIS Jobs um, and search for Conservation Warden. Um, sometimes WIS Jobs can be a little finicky, so I always encourage if you've got two words to put it in quotes, that generally helps narrow your search down a little bit. 
Um, once you find our job posting, you can look at the details about the PD, um, some of the stations that we're filling for, um, get a sense of what some of the minimum qualifications are, and um, then submit your application. So this year, our application is going to be very similar to how it was in 2021. Um, but different than it was in past years. So if you were familiar with how most state of Wisconsin jobs apply, it's through a resume. Um, and this year for the conservation warden hiring process, we, although are required to collect a resume, that is not going to be scored. Instead, what is going to be scored is um, your responses to a series of short answer questions um, that are similar to just kind of tell us about your experience with this um, specific area. And as you write your response, those are then scored against benchmarks by a panel of job experts. So those written responses is actually going to be your application. Um, additionally, we do have six um, question and or yes, no questions that are going to be required as well when you um, go through the application process. And those yes, no questions hit our minimum qualifications. So it's asking you to verify for us that you do meet our minimum standards. And what those are is you have to be at least 21 years old by the time of our onboarding date, which I mentioned can change a little bit from year to year, but generally is about that third Monday in October. Um, it also requires that you um, have no unpardoned felonies or domestic violence convictions on your record. Um, it's also asking you to verify that you are able to drive a Wisconsin vehicle or state of Wisconsin vehicle, which means you can or have um, a valid driver's license, can obtain one, or you currently have one, and um, some information about your current um, vehicle, um, moving violations, and those sorts of things. Um, and then lastly, it'll just um, let you know or ask um, about college require college credit requirements. So um, we require the state of Wisconsin, actually, every law enforcement agency in the state of Wisconsin requires that a person obtain 60 college credits within the first year of hiring. So it is not a requirement that you apply with any college credits, but you will have to obtain 60 college credits within the first five years of employment in order to keep your law enforcement credentials um, violations and those sorts of things. Um, can you hear me still all right? I was just, I think, hearing some feedback. Yes, please continue. Okay, perfect, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so our initial application, as mentioned, is gonna go live. You can expect those Q and A's um, with the yes, no questions the written responses, and then um, you will have to submit a resume, but that is not going to be scored. So um, that is the initial application. That's all there is to it is a few written responses. Mary, did you have anything else? No, I think you covered everything. I don't know if you had maybe a, an error in your message, but it's within the first five years of hire that you need to get those college credits. I think you said one year um, and it was five cool. years. Good catch. Yep. You have five years to get 60 college credits. So apologize about that. Thank you, Mary. Yeah. You can move on to the next slide and we can discuss a little bit about what we're looking for when we hire for conservation wardens. So along with kind of those minimum qualifications, we're also looking for core competencies. So um, we're, we're looking for these skills or these skill sets versus what you might just have we're not looking for just a degree, we're looking for these core competencies. So we want someone and we want to hire somebody who has great communication skills and is willing to serve and able to communicate with a diverse group of individuals who make up the state of Wisconsin. Um, we want people who have a passion for and an interest in protecting the people and natural resources of the state. Um, along with the law enforcement job, we want to hire law enforcement officers who are honest, have integrity, are self-motivated, um, are confident, determined, curious, and very professional. One of the biggest things that we look for in a candidate is an ability to basically self-direct daily work activities. Um, we have a really flexible job, and sometimes we work really weird hours, so we need to hire people who can self-direct their work activities to meet expectations and to fulfill job duties within that time frame. Um, and a lot of the contacts um, are positive. We have, we talk to a lot of people, many of those contacts are positive. However, 
some of them are negative and we have to deliver some bad news sometimes. And we need individuals who aren't going to shy away from those negative contacts per se, um, and are able to step up, do what they need to do and make sure that contact is completed in a professional way. Um, you need to be able to negotiate, listen and solve some problems. Um, this isn't a black and white career. There's a lot of gray area and we want you to be able to critically think and solve some of those problems. Um, another thing, um, we know you don't know everything and we can teach you those items that you don't know, but you have to want to learn about them. Um, so during the hiring process, make sure you are highlighting these core competencies and kind of, um, use skills that you have or use experiences that you have to highlight all of these competencies to show us that you'd make a great warden. Yeah, I, I really, um, Mary, Mary hit it right on the head. Um, and I think a lot of people have some misconceptions. Um, you know, I, I see the Facebook posts that the DNR um, and Sarah's team puts out there and occasionally see a few comments. Um, you know, where people are like, well, I could never be a warden because I don't have a degree in natural resources law enforcement, or I could never be a warden because um, maybe I'm older in my career, or I could never be a warden because um, I, I like to hunt and fish too much. Um, all of those things we hear time and time again about why somebody could never be a warden. And quite honestly, um, none of those things um, really quite honestly, are a deciding factor. The things listed on the screen here, these core competencies are really truly what we look for um, when it comes to who we hire. Um, the integrity piece, obviously we're law enforcement officers, so we need people with the highest level of integrity. Um, we need people who have strong work ethics, as Mary mentioned, the self-direction of work activities. Some of our wardens do have a more structured scheduled shift, but still within that day, you know, their supervisor doesn't tell them what to do every day. Um, so they need to um, decide what's a priority, what needs to get done, where should they go, what should they do. Um, and that is really awesome. Um, I myself, that was one thing that I was really drawn to about the job. But I know other people who um don't like that much flexibility, don't like that loose of structure within their day to day activities. And that's OK. Um, so we want you to know about these core competencies that we're ser searching for, because if these things listed on the screen speak to you and you think, yeah, that's me, I could do those. I, I have good problem solving skills. I've got good communication. Um, I, you know, I'm not shy. I'm not shy for delivering bad news or addressing a potential conflict. Um, then, then we want you to apply. You know, if this is a job that interests you, we want you to apply no matter what those life experiences are or, or where you've um, come from in the past. Um, these are the things that we're really interested in um, when we hire new wardens. And speaking of life experiences, I think that's I, our next slide Mary's gonna cover. Yeah, so you can, um, you can gain or show some of those core competencies through all of your different life and work experiences. So um, we listed a bunch of them here. Um, something to take a look at, something you can read over. Um, volunteer experience is so underrated. And if you're not volunteering now, you should go, even if it's just once a month and volunteer somewhere in your community. We are a big part of our communities that we serve. So we like to see individuals who want to serve the community in which they live as well. And it can be anything. Um, we put teaching, leading, leading, organizing community organizations, civic groups, service organizations, um, church groups, um, you name it. As long as you're showing that commitment to your community, it goes a long way. Um, experience with natural resources through learning. Um, a lot of what we do is teaching and we're educating the public on different things. So um, if you have experience doing those things, make sure you put that on here, um, on your application. Um, experience sharing your passion for natural resources with others. Um, experience serving, working, and engaging in a diverse group of people. Um, 
that can be anything. Draw from work experiences. Um, after college, I was a waitress and a bartender for a really long time. And I was able to talk with a large audience group because I had been put in those situations in the, that service industry and even a retail industry job. So don't shy away from those jobs when you're you're talking about um, you're, when you're pulling from different work experiences. Um, you can um, start thinking about how your life and those work and life experiences relate to the warden career and make sure you're giving us a full picture of who you are and drawing from those work and life experiences. Yeah, I, I really think that once again, you know, we, as I mentioned before, some people think that you have to have a very specific set of education backgrounds or life experiences or work experiences in order to be successful in this job. And um, that's just simply not true. There are certain experiences for sure that would benefit you. Um, you know, somebody coming to us from a, another law enforcement career certainly those career skills are going to be transferable, but so will the career skills that you gain from waitressing or bartending. All those customer service skills that you built up are easily transferable into what we do here. Um, so once again, consider what you've done and, and how has what you've done, whether it's um, in your personal life, in your professional life, or you know through the educational experiences you've gained, um, how have those set you up um, to gain some of those core competencies that we've talked about, um, what sort of um, experiences have you done um, that are transferable to what we do? I think that a lot of what we do is, um, you know, customer service based and working with external customers, but also internal customers. Um, it is a lot of problem solving, as you know, we've mentioned before, um, there is a lot of questions that come up and most wardens will tell you that um, there is not a day in their in career, even if they're about to retire, that they haven't learned something new. Um, there is just so much to do or to learn in this career that we need people who are willing to learn and solve problems um, and think critically um, to find the right solutions and know where to go um, to, to work through some of those things that are presented to us on a daily basis. So um, the communication aspects are key, um, you know, working with people um, who have different viewpoints than you, um, you know, as wardens, we work with everybody. Um, it, it doesn't matter. There's not a specific group. I know that a lot of people tend to think, well, um, conservation wardens enforce um, hunting and fishing laws. And that's the only group that they interact with, but that is, very far from true. And we interact with people who never have hunted and fished. We interact with people who just like to hike or maybe um, are very passionate environmentalists. Um, we businesses, we interact with almost everybody in the state of Wisconsin. And so um, being able to um, communicate and work with people who have differing viewpoints than you or come from different backgrounds, um, that's really critical in this career because it's going to help you along the way um, in what you're trying to accomplish for not only your station um, where you are at Conservation Warden, but also for the whole department. Um, really, we are, once again, public servants. And so we're looking for people who are willing to give back to the community and be that public servant, um, which we are in state service. So the next thing we wanted to talk about is interviews. So, um, you know, we, we just briefly went over um, what we're really looking for, um, you know, the core competencies in how your life and work experience could set you up to build or to um, have developed maybe some of those competencies in, in your um, life experience. And when it comes to either the initial application where you're going to have to respond to prompts about your experience or the interviews or the pre-interview screen, they're all prompts. You know, if you could think of it that way, um, anytime we pose you a question about um, tell us about an experience when you've done X, Y, or Z, um, they're all prompts for you to think about um, what have I done in my life and career and how can I relate it to the job? 
So um, as mentioned, you know, earlier, we'll have the initial application screening, which will be short answer questions. And then we are going to have the pre-panel interview screen. This is a virtual um, screening tool. You can think of it sort of like a, um, a, a brief um, phone interview, but there's nobody on the other end. Um, it's called sometimes called a one-way interview. It's basically a prompt that we provide you that we have you just tell us about your experience in a visual verbal way. So instead of writing it down like you did through the initial application, this through this screen, you are going to um, answer the question into the video camera on your smart device, and we will then rate them after the fact. Um, so that's the pre-interview screen. And then if you're invited past the pre-interview screen to the interview, um, that's an in-person panel traditional interview um, where it's you and um, three to four panel members who ask you a series of interview questions. For um, almost all of our um, parts in the process, you are gonna be provided those interview questions or prompts ahead of time. So with the initial application, um, you can go open and start your application, read the questions, and come back to your application, think through your answer, have you know somebody um, look over your answer, um, talk it through with somebody before you submit your question responses. And as long as you do that before the deadline, um, everything is great. I would actually highly recommend that you have somebody else, you know, kind of look over what you're planning to submit um, because a fresh set of eyes always is helpful when um, submitting application materials. Um, the same with the pre-interview screen, you know, we'll provide you the prompts right away when we invite you to that stage. Um, and you have until the deadline to think over your responses, prepare what you want to say, plan out what you want to say, and then record your responses. Um, in, in the panel interview, once again, um, you arrive early so that we can give you the questions ahead of time. We generally speaking will give about 30 minutes um, for an uh, applicant to review all of the questions ahead of time um, before they go into the full interview. So um, we really, the reason we do this is because we want to see your best effort. Um, we want to see who you are. We know that interviews, generally speaking, and applications can kind of bring up the anxiety or the nerves in a lot of people, especially if you haven't done a lot of them, or maybe this is, you know, kind of new to you. Um, so we know that nerves can sometimes get the best of people, and we really want to see the best of you, not the nervous you. So we do what we can to try to ease that, give you the questions ahead of time so you can think through, logically plan out your responses, because uh, we do truly want you to bring your best self to the table so that we can rate your best self against everybody else's best self. So one way to do that, um, on the next slide, we have a few um, ideas or um, advice and tips for how to prepare for those interviews or, as I mentioned, any prompts. So any of this applies to our initial application, the pre-interview screen, and our panel interviews. Prepare ahead of time. So just like I said, um, you know, not even when you receive the question, but right now, um, before the application um, gets started, or, you know, let's say you're really hoping you're going to make it to the interview stage of our process, start preparing for those virtual um, responses or the in-person interviews right now. Um, generally speaking, um, we can really tell when somebody's practiced you know, they've really worked with themselves to lower their anxiety. They've, you know, practiced in front of a mirror or they had a friend help and, you know, do a little Q&A session with them. Um, that really shines through in an interview. And um, being at ease um, helps you get your best, best self across. You're more able to shine and show your personality if you're not as nervous. So those are all really good things. So if you, if you haven't been practicing interviewing, um, I highly encourage you to do that. Um, for me, it was one of the things that in my personal life um, helped me to get to where I'm at. Um, practice, practice, practice. And then honestly, even though you may not know the questions right now, you could probably do a Google search on the most commonly asked interview questions and, and just start practicing those. Because to be quite honest, um, they're all very similar. 
And um, I, I kind of already told you what I'm looking for. I'm looking for those people with those core competencies. So if you review that slide and think to yourself, how can I show that I have customer service skills? How can I show that, um, you know, I have integrity? How can I show that I have good communication skills? If you think to yourself, you know, what can I do to show that? Is there an example in my life experience where I, I really did, you know, this is a really awesome example of a time um, when I could show or demonstrate that I had great integrity. Think about that ahead of time and bring that. Pre be prepared to share that with the panel or anybody if they ask you that question, because we really do like hearing those actual examples of your real life. Generally speaking, when people interview um, the panel likes to hear an actual time something has happened. Hypotheticals of, well, I, of course, I would never take that $20. You know, um, that's all great. But what we really like to hear is actual examples where um, you did the right thing when nobody was looking or something along those lines. Um, so come prepared. Um, be preparing ahead of time. Start thinking now of examples in your life where you have demonstrated those core competencies that we shared earlier. Um, and then also come to prepare to tell a story about that. So don't just say, well, one time I um, was posed with this challenge at work and then I fixed it. So it all worked out. Um, you want to provide a lot of detail. And I know that sounds like nobody would do that. But when you're really nervous, you tend to be very short in your responses. Um, maybe like me and Mary are running through the slide presentation quicker, um, but you tend to be a little bit more nervous. So if you write things out um, ahead of time, you think through those examples and you kind of highlight the key points and then make sure to use those. What I have listed here is use the star technique. And so a quick Google search um, will help you refresh your memory if you don't want to rewatch this, but um, describe the situation. Um, make sure you tell us what, what the situation was. Also be sure to describe the task at hand. T is for task. So um, what was the objective? What were you supposed to do? Um, and then describe the actions took. So did you have a specific task? What were your specific actions? Um, how did they relate if it's not very clear? And then tell us what happened. What was the result of that? Um, and then finally, and this is the one that I think a lot of people leave out is reflect on that. Reflect on that story, that instance, um, that example, and think back, you know, could I have done something differently? You probably already did it um, in real life, but make sure you share that with the panel. Like after evaluating, you know, how I handled that disgruntled customer, um, I think really next time, if that ever happened again, I would have done this differently. Um, and those sort of things really help to show that you can think critically, you're able to reflect on what happened and how to make improvements. And all of those things are also things that we're looking for in wardens. Um, I think if you talk to any one of us or you do a ride along with us, you'll learn that um, we are constantly debriefing is what we call it, <laughs> um, reflecting on what we just did and how can we do that better next time? OK, maybe that wasn't a perfect contact. Um, maybe, you know, there was just something I didn't like about that. How could I do that differently next time? Um, so we're constantly doing those sort of self-reflection, self seeking self-improvements. Um, and so if you can incorporate that into your interviews in those experiences that you bring to the table, that just shows us that you have what it takes to um, be honest with yourself and strive for that improvement. So think about that um, star technique as you use your story. And then um, another piece of it is be sure to relate it to the career. So um, maybe your example um, isn't very specific a specific to the career. Um, and that's fine. As we mentioned, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be. But if you can take that a step further and say, um, because of this experience, I know that I'm going to be an awesome warden um, because of X, Y, and Z. And it, you know, just show that you can tell that it can easily relate back to the career. Um, that's just one more layer of self-awareness that we really are looking for when we look at candidates. Um, because as mentioned, we do need people who can be self-aware, reflect, and seek self-improvement. 
Um, so as the slide says, aware of your nonverbals. I'm a hand talker. You've, you've probably seen those flying around. Um, practice with a friend and ask questions. Um, do that, you know, potentially you can do that in the interview, but also do that beforehand. So if you're considering applying for this position and you've never reached out to a warden before or um, done a ride along, unfortunately, at this specific moment, we can't do ride alongs. But there may come a time in the summer when we can do ride alongs again. And I'm guessing, to be quite honest, most wardens would be happy to just sit down on the phone with you and talk through what a day in the life is like as a warden, answer any questions you have, and just really help you understand the position a little bit more. So um, if you're interested, don't feel uh, bad about calling up a warden and asking those questions. We have a whole team on our recruitment committee who would be more than happy to do that if you can't get a hold of your local warden. Um, and then lastly, um, have confidence, try to show your personality a little bit that comes with practice um, and tell the panel a little bit about yourself. Um, you know, we always are looking to see who this person is as an individual. Um, and it really helps, I think, the panel just in general. Um, if we can, you know, get to know you as a person and not just applicant number. Um, so come prepared, uh, you know, really have confidence in yourself. Let your personality shine and, and tell us a little bit about who you are. Um, those are my suggestions. Mary, what are yours? I'll just add in, don't sell yourself short. That that interview is, that panel interview, especially is your time in the spotlight and make sure you take advantage of it. Like Kara said, we wanna know who you really are. Um, so give us something to remember you by. Um, that's really important, it makes you stand out. And like I said, just don't sell yourself short, no matter how small something is, if it hits one of those competencies, use it to your advantage. Yeah, that is, that is huge. Um, that comes with the confidence piece. But if you've got questions, you know, as mentioned, um, we're here as a resource, you know, the, the wardens who end up sitting on the panels for reviews and ratings probably can't help you out very much um, because, you know, that would be a conflict of interest, but there's a lot of wardens and not many raters. So I'm sure that if you have a question um, about um, how your skill sets apply to the job or what sort of experiences you think we should, you should maybe highlight, once again, reach out. Um, you know, we're a resource for you. Um, talk to your friends and family. Um, talk to other people at the DNR and, um, Please, you know, um, practice, ask questions. Um, as mentioned, we have a recruitment committee that has consists of a whole bunch of divisional staff members ready to help you answer and bring your best self to the interview. So, all right, next slide. What goes along with the interviews? <clears throat> so if you're asked to participate in one of those panel interviews, you'll also be asked to participate in our physical fitness testing. So these are a set these are set forth by the Department of Justice, their minimum qualifications to become a law enforcement officer. Um, this is what the test involves. It's the vertical jump. We have an agility run. Um, it's, it's nothing crazy. You will be able to do it. And I believe you get two attempts to do it as well. So um, don't get nervous about it. Um, Sit-ups, push-ups, a 300 meter run and a one and a half mile run. So, you need to pass these minimum standards before hire um, and start practicing now. Now is the time to do, to practice all of these. Um, you can find more specifics on the tests on our warden recruitment website. We have some links to the Department of Justice information on it. Um, you can't procrastinate with these. If you know you're weak in upper body strength, so push-ups was always an issue for me. I needed to practice months ahead of time to make sure I met those 18 push-ups by the time the testing occurred. Yeah, thanks, Mary. I'm just going to reiterate, this is a DOJ standard. All law enforcement officers have to meet this standard. And so um, please start practicing now sit-ups, push-ups, and sometimes the 300. But really, it's the sit-ups and push-ups that we see most people um, basically be unable to complete, or that's the one thing that they, they couldn't meet. So practice, 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 um, and practice them now. 
and um, go through them and get yourself prepared because if you're really serious about this career, um, you need to pass this test. Once again, this is set by the Department of Justice. It's not a DNR standard. Um, so you do have to meet these qualifications. And it is the worst feeling to not pass this. Um, I didn't pass it my first time and it was something that um, I was so close but then I ended up not being able to do those push-ups and uh, having to walk away one push-up short is something I don't ever want anybody else to ever have to experience. So make sure you're practicing ahead of time. Yeah, it, it's really tough. So um, thanks for sharing that, Mary, but we know you can do it. Um, if you get serious about it now, I know that um, we just went through it um, and give yourself too much uh, a few months and, be dedicated. I know you can get there. Once again, we are going to do our interviews in May. So that's also when we'll do this physical fitness testing. So you do have a few months yet um, to really get up to speed if you need to. The next thing we're going to talk about is background investigations. I know our slides went away briefly, but Mary, do you want to just start chatting about that? Um, sure. Um, we... Oh. What, <laughs> Sorry, I can talk about it if you want, Kara. <laughs> you might have. I just realized bit. it was on my slide list, wasn't it? <laughs> That's okay. Um, so, background investigations after the interview and the physical fitness is the background investigation, and our background investigations um, take quite a bit of time because they um, first we have to ask you to fill out a questionnaire, which is very lengthy. And um, it will take you a while to complete. Um, you know, it goes back in your life history about, um, you know, when did you live here and who were your roommates and all this stuff from college. So if you um, are older, it's going to take you longer to fill out because we just ask you to go back a significant amount of time and um, get all this information. Um, Katie, you can go to the next slide if you've got the slides back up. Um, and then once you fill out the questionnaire, then um, you, we provide that to a background investigator who goes through um, the packet with you, reviews anything, asks any follow-up questions, and then starts doing reference checks. And that's really what it is. It's a very, very thorough reference check. So the key here is honesty. Um, we understand that nobody is perfect. Um, but what we're looking for are people that can meet those core competencies and the chief one is honesty. So, uh, if you lie at any point during the background investigation or on your paperwork, unfortunately, that's just not a risk we can take. Um, so you need to be completely honest and transparent with us regarding anything found in your background. Um, so um, once the background investigations have concluded, there will be a very short um, post um, background interview um, with the hiring manager, who generally speaking would be me. Um, and then once offers are made and approval has been had to provide offers through the chief and HR um, and our legal, um, once we provide conditional offers, that's when um, we require everybody to go through um, the medical um, and psychological tests. So you would see a, a physician and a psychologist who would assess you on your um, fit for duty um, physically and mentally to be a law enforcement officer. Um, if you pass both of those, then you're provided a final a, a appointment letter, so to speak. So there are quite a few steps. Um, we expect that those um, conditional offers will go out in September, early September, with some of those post-conditional uh, medical appointments being in September. And then once again, um, the position starting in October. And when you start in October, you start our academy. Mary? Yeah, so you can move on to the next slide. So we have, everybody is required to go through a 720 hour law enforcement academy if you haven't done so already. So we have DNR officials or conservation wardens that come in and teach most of the classes and our instructors. Um, it's possible, and Kara can go into this a little bit, that we'll have an eight week abbreviated academy for those who have already completed a 720 hour law enforcement academy. Yeah, yep. So um, anybody who applies to us who 
has never been a law enforcement officer before is required to attend the Department of Justice Academy, which I'll get into next. But um, those that come to us with prior law enforcement experience, um, if you have current active credentials, um, we can put you into an abbreviated academy. So you don't have to sit back through the full um, pretty lengthy um, law enforcement academy. It's a shorter academy where you're really learning about our policies, our procedures. Um, we're ensuring that, you know, your use of force decision making is the same as ours would be or where we want to see it. We get you used to driving our types of vehicles. Um, and we start getting you familiar with some of the rules and regulations, um, our type of report writing, our systems. It's really a get used to how the DNR works academy um, before we put you into field training. And so the, the two academies kind of meet up at some point. Everybody goes into field training. There's a whole bunch of post academy training weeks where we teach you those nitty gritty skills that you maybe haven't experienced before. Um, you get assigned to your permanent station. There's some second year advanced training that goes on all while you're under a two year probationary period. So that's an overview of once you get hired the next two years. But on the next slide, we're going to start breaking down some of these things just a little bit further. Um, so as I mentioned, the 720 hour academy is a requirement of the Department of Justice. They regulate that academy. Um, the the DNR does host our own academy. So the people we hire who need that go through our academy instead of going through something like you would see at Western Technical College or Fox Valley Tech. Um, they come to our academy and it's essentially the exact same. All the courses you see here are exactly what we teach all law enforcement officers across the state. The only difference is that in our academy, it has a little bit of a DNR twist to it. So instead of writing reports, about a theft from a motor vehicle, you may be writing reports about a theft from a state park. Um, so we just have a little bit of a twist to our um, academy that helps you integrate to the DNR's um, culture and policy and procedures just a little bit quicker than um, you know a traditional academy might. Um, let's see here. Is there anything I'm missing there, Mary? Or are we good to, you wanna talk about field training? Yeah, we can move on to field training next. So after you're all completed with your academy and you graduate and you're sworn in, um, you can begin field training. So with field training, you're paired with somebody who's already out in the field, an experienced warden. And this year we'll be doing four different field training locations that'll be about five weeks long. So we try to do those field training locations throughout the state because every station is a little bit different and we want you to be able to get the most experience as you can in real life scenarios throughout the state. We try to do one field training assignment in either close to or at the station where you'll be um, towards the end of it. Otherwise, we try to do one close to where you're living to make it a little bit easier on you. So that's on the job training. It's real world experiences. You're doing license checks. You're out on boats. Um, you're doing the same things that you would be doing if you didn't have your field training officer with you. So it's a lot of mentoring and a lot of evaluation during that time, but it's a ton of fun and you learn some really great things. Um, it's your time to be put into those situations and have somebody to reflect on when you're done, how it could have been done differently, how they would have done it and ways to improve in the future, basically. So um, during this time, your housing and all your meals are provided for you. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, and you do, you, it, you can work with your field training officer on days off and it's, it's relatively flexible um, with their schedule. Um, if you have conflicts or issues that come up. But um, a really great time to practice what you learned in the academy and put it into pra real world practice. And I'll also just say during field training and even when you're done with field training, you're still not expected to be an expert. Um, I learn new things every day still, um, but you're just not expected to know everything when you're done. Um, that's what your whole career is there for. Yeah, we just asked that, yeah, if you don't know, you ask, right? And I think that's all the public expects of us is that if we don't know the answer to the question, we tell them that and we find the answer for them. So that's where that's, those problem solving skills come in. 
So that's field training. Um, we can go to the next slide and just kind of cover some specialized training. Yeah, so after field training is done, um, you'd move to your assigned station. And then during, it's normally about a year in your assigned station, while you're still on probation, you're doing some more specialized training. So um, we have week-long trainings that involve learning how to operate boats, snowmobiles, ATVs, because that's the equipment that we use while we're patrolling. Um, we have state lands training week. So while we're doing shifts on state properties, um, we have training that helps you be put in some of those scenarios that you might encounter when you're on ships there. Um, accident investigation training, waterfall week, which is so much fun. Um, normally you're working for the opener of waterfall season. So you get to experience that if you haven't before. Um, fall hunt week, tons of really great trainings that are just more specialized into what you might run into out in the field. Um, like we've mentioned before, it's a continued learning period. Again, we're not expecting you to know everything, but you have to want to learn about it and be ready to engage and try. So this is another time where you get to integrate with your new team. So when you're in your field training station, you'll have, or when you're in your assigned station, you'll have surrounding wardens and that's your time to really get to know who you're working with. Um, get to know them and be able to use them as a resource to kind of help mentor you along the rest of your um, probationary period and your warden career. Kara, do you have anything else to add there? Yeah, I was just going to mention that um, this talks about station assignments. Historically, station assignments weren't necessarily known until you were along, quite a ways along in the training process. But we've um, adjusted how we run our hiring process and how we um, open stations up for relocations and transfers. And so um, starting this year in 2022, um, the current vacant warden stations will be listed on the job announcement. And so those are stations that we are hoping to fill with the current recruitment. Once you are provided a conditional offer, on that conditional offer, it will say what station you will eventually be expected to report to. So um, as mentioned, you know, you get your conditional offer, it says, congrats, you got to go through some tests, but then, you know, we want to have you be the warden in um, Manitowoc County. Um, then you have to go through a year of training or a little less if you come with other law enforcement experience. And then after that, you'll report to that Manitowoc County station. So it's about a year um, before you end up in your actual team assignment. Um, but during that whole time you're in training, you have your lodging and meals basically are reimbursed because you're out on training assignments. So that's new this year and we're really excited to bring that to you so that you can see, um, you know, the perspective of where you might have to move to if, if you're interested in moving. Um, so I think that wraps up our real formal um, part of the process. We wanted to remind you that we are opening our process um, in mid-February. And so in 2022, that will be on Monday. Um, so start preparing your application materials if you have any questions about the job in general, like what do wardens do or how do we do them? Um, what did, what is a day like? Go to our website, um, you know, go to the dnr.wi.gov, search warden recruitment. You'll see all the information there. We have a similar webinar that we recorded last year, just about what a day in the life of a warden is like. You can watch that video. Um, you can also email us at DNRLE recruitment. Um, if you have specific questions, we'd be more than happy to answer them. But I think at this time we saved about 10 minutes and uh, maybe we're hoping for a few more for some questions from the uh, listening audience. Yeah, thank you, uh, Carrie, Kara and Mary, combining your names together there. Uh, that was really great. We're getting some great questions here uh, on YouTube. Uh, for anyone who is still watching who has questions, feel free to put them in the live chat and we will uh, try to get everyone's answered. Uh, the first one I have here is from Harvey and he's wondering if there are any upper age limits uh, on that, uh, on, on the hiring, uh, if, if there's that upper age limit to apply. There is not, no. So minimum age of 21 by appointment, no upper age limit. Um, and age should not deter you. Obviously, we do have some um, physical fitness standards that everybody has to meet no matter their age, but um, the age should not deter you. We have definitely hired wardens who are 
we call this their second career. You know, they retired from their first and now they're with us and they're fantastic wardens. So age is not a limit, upper limit. Perfect. Thank you. And uh, Andrew is wondering, does federal service from, for example, DOD transfer over to the state level in any way? Oh, really good question. One that I probably can't answer at the moment. Um, I would have to get a little bit more information about what exact um, experience, what are you referencing, like as in pay or years of service, those sorts of questions. I'm not exactly sure, but please email the me directly. Um, you can find my email address on the website um, or the DNR LE recruitment, and we'd be happy to help you answer that. Perfect. Uh, so, uh, username adventures here is wondering once you get hired and go through all of the training, how do you get assigned where you'll be working? How often do people have to move after hiring to live in the area of their assignment? Yeah, good question. So as I just touched on, um, at the end there, uh, you will know if you are provided an offer for a job, you will know exactly what station you need to report to. So um, you will really only have to move once um, if you don't currently live within those um, living requirements that we have. So if you don't currently live within the station boundaries, you'd be required to move to that station by the, um, before you are essentially required to report there. And then once you're there, um, any move after that is up to you. So um, we do offer yearly relocation opportunities where if you desire moving to a different part of the state, once you're off probation, you've served that initial two years, um, then you can certainly uh, do that. So any moves after that would be up to you. And did I cover that whole question, Katie, or was there more? Nope, I think you, you touched on all of it. Okay. So you guys talked a lot about, you know, preparing for the interview process, practicing ahead of time, taking notes, getting ready that way. Sarah is wondering, is it frowned upon during the pre-interview screen to see people checking their notes? Um, no. Uh, so um, actually, I, I personally recommend notes uh, at any stage in the process. I think uh, we have notes in front of us right now, as a matter of fact. Um, and I think that having reference material so you don't forget something is a great suggestion. I often go into interviews just um, for myself with notes in front of me. So you are more than welcome to reference notes. All righty. And Brad is wondering when it comes to those references, how many will you need? And are there any specific recommendations on their relationship to you? Mary, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Or do you want to guess? Um, well, I want to say that it's three professional and three social, or maybe that was when I had gotten hired. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but it really, they'll give you a description of what the reference like the definition of what a professional reference would be or what the definition of a social reference would be. Um, but that's something you wouldn't have to worry about until that background came up. Um, and you'll have plenty of time to get that done. Um, but maybe start thinking about that. Who are your former bosses? Who would you be able to contact um, to be a reference for you? Something to think about now so that when you make it to that portion of the hiring process, you're able to um, get their information a little bit quicker because you've already thought about it. Yeah, so um, we're, we will always ask for past supervisors. Also, um, any sort of coworkers that you've worked with, at least one coworker from each prior um, job you've had. Um, and then, like Mary mentioned, just some other categories, professional, um, you know, educational, your college advisor. Um, so we ask for a whole bunch of them. And um, if I think you were asking about relationship um, and, you know, their relationship to you. Um, I would start with people, obviously, who have been good mentors to you or um, who know you very well. And quite honestly, that's the responsibility of our background investigator is to sit down with you, talk to you through that and ask, is there anybody else on the list who I, you think I should talk to? And at that time, if there's more people, you can definitely provide them with those names. Great. Thank you. Um, we have another one here wondering where is the academy held? Is it just at Fort McCoy? Or are there other options for where it is located? 
Oh, that's a great question. And it's something that I was on my notes, I didn't quite get to. Um, so our academy is currently um, this year and last year, it was held at Western Technical College. Um, so in the past, we've held, held it at Fort McCoy at the State Patrol Academy. Um, and we have the ability to house it kind of wherever our needs are best met. And so um, we would anticipate it being in the very same location. So Sparta, Toma, Fort McCoy area. Um, that's, we only run one academy a year. Um, the question about other locations may be stemming from the fact the first year we ran an abbreviated academy, it was at a different location. Um, but going forward, both our 720 hour law enforcement academy and our abbreviated kind of DNR academy are going to be held at the same place, likely in that, um, Sparta area. Great. And is there any sort of expedited, expedited training for new hires, uh, you talked about that expedited training for the law enforcement experience, but what about if you have any sort of prior military wilderness water survival training type stuff, any, any sort of expedited track for that? There is not. So essentially what it comes down to is that um, this is a law enforcement position. So we wear badges on our chest. We carry guns on our hips. We are certified law enforcement officers of the state of Wisconsin. And in order to be law enforcement officers in the state of Wisconsin, you need law enforcement credentials, which can only be obtained through going through a 720 hour Department of Justice um, accredited academy. Um, and so that's why we have that requirement there. Um, and all of our conservation wardens need to go through that unless they come to us with law enforcement credentials. Um, so we do not have any sort of abbreviated academy for people who come to us with different skill sets or military experience. Um, but I will say, if you do have those special experiences or skill sets, um, we can use them. So um, just because you may be a trainee in our class, if you've taught wilderness survival, um, we can use you as a resource when we are training your fellow classmates. That's something that I think is really awesome about our academy is we pull people from all over. And um, even though they're maybe, maybe all learning about how to be law enforcement officers, somebody's an expert turkey hunter, somebody has worked customer service for us before, um, you name it. You know, we have people um, who come with different skill sets from different areas and they can really help their classmates. Um, you know, it's, it's a collective learning um, experience. So it's really awesome. We can use those, but unfortunately, no special academy. All right. Fantastic. And so if you don't get hired your first time around, uh, can you and are you encouraged to apply again? Mary? Most definitely. Um, don't let not getting hired deter you from this really awesome career. Um, Firsthand experience in it. Um, I tried again the second year and got hired. Um, keep trying. It's well worth it at the end. Um, it's a long process, but like I said, well worth it. Um, I wouldn't want to be doing anything else. Great. Uh, and I'm just trying to get through as many of these here as we can. Um, do you have an approximate number of people who will move on to each stage, maybe conditional offers, uh, how many we're looking to hire? Sure. So the total number we're looking to hire this year is 10 to 15. And to be quite honest, that's been about consistent for several years. Um, some years it's a little higher, some years it's a little lower. It all just depends on our vacancies and budgets. Um, so approximately every year, 10 to 15 wardens and how many people move on each step is really dependent on a, how many we want to hire? Because we kind of work backwards from that. Um, but also, B, how many applicants we have. So um, I, I think that, by and large, you should really just focus on bringing your best self to the table. Um, if you are, you know, um, you have those competencies, you um, can tell us that you have those competencies and tell us how that relates to the job and how awesome of a warden you're going to be. Um, then you're gonna do just fine in our process. So um, I would worry a little bit less about you know, how much competition there is because at the end of the day, um, bring your best self forward and um, that's really all you can do. Um, and I think that goes a long ways. And as mentioned, you know, um, get some help, get some resources, talk it over with friends, family, um, other wardens. Um, you know, if this is something you really want to pursue, put in the time and effort to um, do your research and, and learn um, the different parts about the job and how you can bring your best foot forward. 
Awesome. And I know we're over, but we had some technical difficulties at the beginning. So we'll give it a couple more minutes here and answer a few more. Um, can you apply as an LTE if like to get your foot in the door uh, if your desired assignment unit isn't available at this time? Great question. Uh, this year, we are not hiring any LTEs with this recruitment. In years past, we have, but going forward, we will only be hiring full-time wardens out of this recruitment. Uh, we have started a community service officer program, which is um, an LTE program um, to help people who want to get their foot in the door, get some experience, do that before they apply for the full-time position. So um, unfortunately, that position has just recently closed, um, but we expect to continue that program. And I would encourage you to look into that and apply when that opens back up potentially next in, in December, January timeframes. Awesome. And is it common for people to be hired directly out of school uh, without much, you know, work experience post-graduation? Sure. So I think that um, we have definitely hired people right out of school. I myself was hired almost right out of school. Um, I know that we've hired quite a few people right out of college. Um, once again, it's really about bringing that sort of best foot forward. And what do you have for your life experiences um, that you can show are transferable skill sets to the current job? Some people may have those right after college. Other people, maybe it takes them a few years to get some of those skill sets. Um, and that's okay. Everybody kind of gets there at a little bit of a different time, but um, we have definitely hired people right out of college. Fantastic. And we'll do two more here. Uh, if you're currently living out of state, uh, but you're interested in relocating here for a job here, do you need to come to Wisconsin for the fitness testing and or the interview? Or are there ways to work around that? Yes. So um, generally speaking, you do have to come that one time. We have done our best to consolidate the process um, to having out-of-state applicants only come once during that interview fitness week. That's why we hold them at the same time. Um, if there are extenuating circumstances, such as a military deployment, we have definitely made accommodations for those circumstances. Um, but generally speaking, out-of-state applicants um, would be required to come interview in person and physical fitness test in person. All right, fantastic. And last one for both of you, what are your favorite parts of the job and what made you want to apply? Mary? Um, I can go first, yeah. Um, I wasn't one of those people who from the age, from their earliest age, they knew that they wanted to be a conservation warden. It was something over time, I realized I really enjoyed wildlife. I really enjoyed the outdoors. I really enjoyed natural resources. And I wanted to do something that had to do with that. What it was, I wasn't quite sure in college. Um, but afterwards, um, I know I made a connection with um, one of my family had made a connection with one of their local wardens. And I, my dad, I think was the one that said, Hey, I think you would be really good at this. And the more I researched the career, I realized, yes, this is something I wanted to do because I wanted to leave the world kind of a better place than what I left it. And this was how I was going to do that. So not something I always knew I wanted to do, but um, super rewarding career. Um, I go home every day learning something new. I've had good conversations with people. Um, I wouldn't want to do anything else. So um, there's tons of versatility with this job. Um, I'm doing something new every day and it really challenges me as, as well, which I really enjoy. I think Mary, <laughs> we're the same person. Geez, that sounded almost identical to um, my story. Um, I think the part was, what do you enjoy most about the day? And uh, as a warden, when I was in the field, um, I really enjoyed that kind of making a difference, interacting with different community members, um, you know, having an impact on the natural resources, uh, a positive impact. And so, um, those are things that I think we are really looking for. You know, I, I do want to underscore that this is a law enforcement position. We are expected to do law enforcement duties every day. Um, you know, whether that means um, responding to an active shooter in our area or um, 
any a backup assistance to the local law enforcement officers investigating, you know, a, a deadly crash. Um, there are quite honestly, I know this is all you asked, Katie, but there are some downsides, you know, to, to law enforcement. Um, but in my experience, the positives have greatly outweighed some of those um, harder moments to get through, um, which is really, you know, kind of kept me going and I think keeps most people going. Um, and it's really knowing that, you know, we're making a difference in our community and, and um, doing something for the greater good of the natural resources and all the citizens of the state of Wisconsin. So um, it, we having a passion for what we do, knowing that, you um, you know, this is law enforcement and you're, you're going to be a law enforcement officer with a little bit of a twist to it um, is, is a pretty awesome gig. Um, and we're really looking for people who are passionate and have a desire to um, do all of those things. So did that answer your question, Katie? Yes, absolutely. Sarah? Oh, and thank you both for tonight for helping explain what it is that you do, what the warden service is, and how to have a great application. And so that concludes tonight's information session. And thanks to all of you who are tuned in this evening. Thank you for considering becoming the conservation warden for the Wisconsin DNR. Should you have any additional questions, please feel free to use the email address that you see on your screen here. And someone from our recruitment team will get back to you. Once again, Thank you for joining us and have a wonderful evening.